Hi, it's Brian. On today's episode of Heart to Heart, I chatted with Mary Lou Belli, a seasoned professional with an extensive portfolio in the television industry. After starting as an actor, Mary Lou quickly rose to prominence as a director, delving into both sitcoms and episodic directing. Notably, she's been attached to the highly successful show NCIS New Orleans for seven noteworthy seasons. Mary Lou's dedication extends well beyond her directorial pursuits, as she is heavily involved in numerous initiatives and coaching programs aimed at supporting up-and-coming talent in the industry. With Mary Lou on board, expect an engaging discussion. Before you listen, you've got to grab our Backstage Pass. It's packed with Mary Lou's top tips, insider advice, and additional resources that will give you a competitive edge. You can grab the Backstage Pass by going to podcastbackstagepass.com. I got my degree in three years at Penn State, and I graduated as a triple threat because um, I got my BA in theater in the theater department, but I was also studying with the best voice teacher there in the music department, and I was dancing in the physical ed department with the big um, ballet teacher there. Um, so I came to New York, and I would audition for things that were for singer dancers and dancer singers, um, mm-hmm. as well as just straight acting stuff. You know, I, I did my my, my under fives on soap operas and stuff like that. Um, and it was, uh, it was a journey. Um, I would audition for, uh, commercial auditions. I met my husband at one, um, Mm -hmm. we're still together today. Um, and, um, the big hump as an actor, when you first reach New York is to get your equity card, which was my first, um, union card. And then I think, I think SAG, SAG went next and after one another. And in New York, the extras were under, I think, I don't think there was an extras agreement. I think you were a SAG member. So I, I, I even stood in on a couple big, like, A-list movies. Um, you know, did the obligatory, you know, wait in another room while Woody Allen is looking at everybody and picking extras for his stuff. You know, you don't there, but everybody knows he's there. Um, well, you went to but, Penn State um, University Park, right? Uh, yeah, I went to the main campus at main University campus. Park, which is in the did, geographical center of the state. And did you but always you know, knew? Things like, um, you know, Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera for every summer. And um, and I ended up spending every summer at Penn State while I was there because they had a, a wonderful, wonderful guest artist program where they would bring in um, actors and directors from New York City and actually, the two of the actors that I met through that, my summer work there, um, helped me get my first and second agents in New York. Wow. And did you always know you wanted to be an actor? Uh, yeah. Well, pretty much. It, during high school, it was go to cooking school and become a chef or, you know, do what I had been trained to do since I was seven, which was sing and dance. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I soon figured out after New York that it's actually not what I wanted to do. <laughs> mm. So that was the second part of New York. Movie. So yeah, you were uh, in New York doing acting and then what made, like, what was that? How did the transition go from New York you know, to LA? And I was a working actor. I mean, I had like stellar reviews in the New York Times and the Daily News for, you know, off-Broadway stuff I was doing, production contract stuff I was doing. Um, and then I got to LA and four days after I reached here, I, I was working on a sitcom that my husband knew the um, creator of. Um, actually, we, we were sleeping in his den, you know, on a pull-out sofa. Um, okay. he, he had slept on our pull-out sofa in New York a couple times, too. So it oh, was wow. okay. so quo. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was encouraged by the person on the first sitcom I worked on, which was created by Ian Fraser and Howard Gewertz, um, that I was coaching the kids because I was standing in for a kid, but also being their coach and then doing the part when the child was still in school. She was a 16-year-old actor, taught her how to drive on the back lot at Universal um, in my beat-up car, uh, (laughs) uh, which my husband had stored in his parents' uh, garage because he had, uh, his parents were living in uh, Southern California at the time. And um, I 
was encouraged to direct the, one of the actors, a, a wonderful, wonderful for people who know um, sitcom history. He played Mr. Carlin on the original Newhart show um, and had a six figure income probably as a voiceover artist for decades. His name was mm. um, uh, uh, Jack Riley, fabulous mm-hmm. man. Um, and, um, and he said, you're a director. And I argued with him because at Penn State, I had taken one class and I sucked. But a lot of that was just, you know, being a director is you're the leader. I was very young. Um, How old were you? Were you a lot of world experience at that point? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I got my degree in three years, so I was, you know, out. Um, I was an older. I was. I'm born in January, so I was probably twenty, twenty one by the time I graduated from college. I mean, it was. I was young. And when you were um, in LA, you were like 24, 25? No, 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 much younger than that. I, f- I forget how old. Okay. I, I, I can't, my daughter's birthday is this week. My husband had to correct me about it. I said, she's in her 20s. He said, no, she's over 30. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, the, only, the only dates I recognize is the dates they applied to, you know, the, the, sometimes the year they were born because I had to write it or help them write on so many college applications. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah. um, I, um, I, I did think, oh, but I really like this rehearsing part way better than the performing part. And that was the secret of looking inside and realizing Mm. that figuring out the puzzle was way, way more important than, than putting the puzzle on display. Mm -hmm. Um, When I was in New York, there was a a big Broadway hit called Applause and the title the title song with the title lyrics were what is it that we're living for applause applause and i went "Mm, no i'm not (laughs) Mm. or i'm not at all i don't need that never wanted it i'm the kind of person who walks in front of a mirror and never looks at myself Mm -hmm. um uh so i realized rehearsing and making this puzzle fit together was what I really loved. So I went to the theater company where my husband had been a long term time member. Mm-hmm. Um, he had asked, been asked to join theater West, which uh-huh. still exists. Great company. Um, well, he was still in college in Southern California. Um, and it was the first pl- a play. The first play I saw in LA was at that theater company. And it was the first one I joined as a membership mm. um, organization. And then company of angels, uh, was also a place mm-hmm. I was very, very involved. And now I'm still members of two different companies here. Uh, so theater was my lifeline. And it's where I started to practice my craft as a director. Mm-hmm. Um, I asked a New York actor that I had known. Um, and then that person, the late Bob McCracken, who just passed away, wonderful, wonderful actor and director, um, who had starred in that first play I had seen at Theater West. Mm -hmm. Um, and I cast them in a play. I can't remember how I came across this play. It was by Judlier Silverman, who went on to be one of my son's teachers at the BFA program at Pace University, small, small world. Um, Artistic family. (laughs) I know. And he had, um, he had written this lovely, lovely play that I still think would make a great short film or feature film called Today's Special, about a Mm. lonely spinster school teacher who wanders into a diner on the day it is closing, Mm. Um, you know, because the freeway is, you know, made it too late to, nobody ever comes here anymore. And Mm. it was about the relationship between this, um, these two people. And then of course, the uh, guy who's fixing her car, because that's why she's stuck at this uh, diner, the school teacher. Mm. And um, I ended up doing two productions of it, one at Theater West and then another under the wonderful Ted Schmidt um, uh, at the Cast Theater with two different casts mm-hmm. um, and and starting a lifelong relationship with um, uh, the actors in it, but also with a manager here in town, um, Marilyn Atlas, um, who still handles talent and writers and is, you know, as keen on giving back and diversity as I am. And, um, she, uh, she had just produced, Marilyn had just produced, um, Real Women Have Curves, um, the movie, uh, and the play. And I still think she represents Josefina who wrote that. 
Um, so it was just a kind of a coming together. And I happened to be coaching on shows and I said, can I watch mm. and possibly, you know, set up my own kind of uh, shadowing program um, where I was doing shot lists or, or block or, you know, writing down shots for every show um, episode where I was the coach on the show or working mm. with the kids on the show. Um, and I probably did that for close to a hundred episodes. Wow. Wow. And then I echoed that same kind of autodidactic um, pattern when I knew I wanted to, after directing over 125 episodes of sitcoms, that I wanted to go into being a um, director of episodic, particularly. I wanted to be an action director mm. <clears throat> or at least a procedural director. You know, I was mm. like so enamored with law and order and all the NCISs. And then I ended up directing NCIS New Orleans for almost eight years for seven seasons. Um, so that was a dream come true. But uh, in terms of that, the transition from being a sitcom director to an episodic director, it was like starting my career over. And mm. in order to do that before any of the diversity programs where they were, you know, saying, Hey, let's uplift women who really haven't had mm -hmm. a chance. Mm -hmm. um, I just called people. I knew the, one of the, the, I think the second show I directed was a show called Major Dad. Um, and uh, the woman who played the uh, wife of the titular character, Major Dad, who, who was mm -hmm. uh, Mackie, Gerald McCraney, was Shanna Reed. And her husband at that time was finishing his master's, I think, at AFI, Terrence O'Hara, who was going mm. to probably direct over 200 episodes. He was very, very, very generous to me. And he asked me to come on shows that he was working on and observe. And more than that, you know, when he sat down to have lunch and the exec producer joined him, he said, and hey, this is Mary Lou, you know, and on Major Dad, it was Michael Lembeck who did that for me. And then mm -hmm. when I was jumping into Episodic, it was Bethany Rooney and lots of other mm -hmm. wonderful mm -hmm. directors who mm -hmm. allowed me to shadow them. Now those opportunities are fewer and far between for people initiating it themselves. But I just asked, you know, yeah. you know, you know, what <laughs> the initiative. <laughs> exactly. And now um, most of those pro people who are getting the opportunity to do that are people who are coming through programs that I'm part mm -hmm. of, of the teaching of, um, mm -hmm. be it Sony or ABC or NBC or CBS or mm -hmm. Warner Brothers or AFI or um, AFI directing workshop for women. Um, all these places, or a former USC student of mine, you know, where I mm -hmm. was on the faculty for 10 years. So um, I do a huge amount of advocacy. I'm also on the boards or advisory boards or whatever they call them for Film Fatale, Women in Media, Alliance of Women Directors, and a mm -hmm. long-term um, member um, uh, of Women in Film. So I've always taken advantage of knowing advocacy for myself and for mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm very 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 active in my guild in the directors guild. Mm -hmm. I just love all the initiatives, all the programs that you spearhead and are part of, and you still make time to teach for us. So I I was as you were talking, I was like busy like jotting down notes because there's so many parts where I'd love to elaborate, you know, have you elaborate on, and because I think yeah. it's going to be so helpful for our listeners just to to think sometimes you know like a lot of actors or artists or people in the industry feel that it's like one path that I can't take like you know curveballs or you can't, you know, juggle multiple balls without it being, you know, delegitimizing yourself as a quote unquote artist. Um, and yet your career really proves like you succeeded as an actor and you've succeeded as a comedy director. And you've succeeded as an episodic and procedural director. Um, and now with all the advocacy you do and, you know, none of it, you've done so much and none of it delegitimizes you as a, as a, as an artist. Wouldn't you say? Well, and also I have to say that and maybe it's the internet that helped this, or maybe just a broadening of um, perspective, especially by actors. Mm -hmm. I know so many actors who have turned to writing and or directing mm -hmm. who are absolutely multi-hyphenates. And I would say if there was any advice I wish had been given to me sooner was develop your own stuff. Mm. Um, uh, there's, I, I literally, you know how, you know, my, my texts has come up before 8 AM this morning, I had at least four texts and three more just came up as I've been talking to you with, and I won't say who it is, but an actor who, who I met 
on a TV series I was directing, who then let me know before um, the last season we had together that, you know, he also happened to write. Well, you know, everybody says that. But he sent me five pilots. I mean, he sent five projects he had written and one was better than the next. And now he is on a huge primetime hit show. And I said, are you hitting them up? to write mm-hmm. an episode mm-hmm. next season. You know, I said, you should be yeah. talking about this. So, um, and I can't tell you how many other uh, people, and, and again, you know, to say, I want to do everything. I think if I were an actor, I would want to specify, do you want to really write or do you want to really direct? Not that one can't lead to the other, mm-hmm. but to do both simultaneously it would be rather unusual to get a shot at that. But- mm-hmm. To, for people to develop their own projects um, and don't think you have to do it all by yourself. You know, even if it's a short film you want to star in, you know, find the writer, find the director, find mm-hmm. the people who are as hungry as you are to move to that next step um, mm-hmm. or that next level. <laughs> That's right. Right behind me. <laughs> um, and, and be entrepreneurial. There is, right. there is, um, there is a huge taste in this town for people who have enthusiasm and initiative. And if mm-hmm. you prove that you have that, um, everybody wants to go on the ride with you because their your success is their success as well. Hey, it's Brian. I'm dropping in on an important announcement. What you need to know is you have more control over your career than you think. The thing standing between you and the career you want is your connections. And that's where one-on-one next level comes in. If you are not a member yet, you can apply to join at oneononenextlevel.com. Press pause and do that now. If you are already a member and you are ready to get back on track, we want to invite you to book a strategy session with us led by myself personally. We will help you prioritize which classes make the most sense given your career goals. You can find these under the resource hub in your account portal. We can't wait to hear your success story. Kind of wanted to rewind a little bit in your journey uh, because as you said you were a successful actress and you know uh, and, and had you know you were working how did you know and then we talked a little bit about your transition into directing you know in the theater how did you quote unquote give it up like did you realize it was very you easy in- to up, but I was also very 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 realistic especially in the theater about mm-hmm. what I looked like I knew that I had gotten opportunities I'm under five feet tall Okay. I, uh-huh. you know, that. I'm under five feet tall. Um, as far as I knew I wasn't the pretty best friend, I knew I wasn't quite character as as other people I was competing against. So once I thought that that window of me getting opportunities because I was tiny and looked younger than my age was over, um, and I realistically, I looked in the mirror and went, hmm, let's just let's just talk odds here you know Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. you're you're at the top of your game you're competing against the best but I also was competing against people who were better like Mm -hmm. one of my closest friends to this time she's done the lead in three Broadway shows she's truly one of the best voices of the century it's not Kristen Chenoweth is it what it's not Kristen Chenoweth, is it? No, it's not Kristen. But Kristen was on no. But this woman's taller, and she was first oh. runner in Miss America. It's Mary D'Arcy, um, who played Mandy's wife in Sunday in the Park, uh, who played Christine Daae on Broadway in Phantom of the Opera, and was the lead in Singing in the Rain on Broadway, amongst oh. many, many. You know, uh-huh. you know Richard Harris's Guinevere in the last tour that Richard Harris did of Camelot. I mean, just worked forever. Right. And gorgeous and nice and lovely and talented and could act and could sing and could dance. But I went, I'm, I'm really good. I'm really good. I'm competitive. I met Mary because I had done a show with her. Um, but I was never going to be that good. Never. Mm. Never. And you realized that in New York before you moved to L.A.? or I really, Yeah, probably in New York. But also when I was in New York, probably one of the last big auditions I had I had a feeling I was the best person who auditioned and didn't get a part. Mm-hmm. And I went, and, and ego has never been a problem of mine. Um, but I'm also very, very realistic. And I went, hmm, I didn't get that. And, you know, and after my eighth audition for Annie on Broadway, you know, <laughs> my relationship with 
Mar- Martin Sharnin would say, hey, Mary Lou, I'd go, hey, Marty, how you doing? And he'd go, now, how tall are you again? You know, and I was 4'11". 4'11 was the cutoff mm. for the for the um, orphans, but not really tall enough for one of the adults. So, you know, I was sort of smack in the middle. And mm. the most important thing, I, which I already mentioned, was I really didn't like performing that much. And when wow. I was doing okay. the work, that the, the theater company, Theater West, where I first directed, I joined mm-hmm. as an actor. And I was mm-hmm. doing great work. But, you know, I also started producing there. Chaz Pamentary asked me to produce A Bronx Tale. And I said, oh, Chaz, how am I going to fill the seats? <laughs> I had a hint how good it was. I knew how good right. it was. He was right. it at Theater West. And it was extraordinary. And his tale, Bronx Tale, um, with it was very, very strategic and very smart. And he knew also how to cast himself mm-hmm. um, and when to hold on to a project that people like and attach yourself to it. It's so funny, Mary Lou. He was the, he was the uh, first guest on our podcast and he talked about the story of how he held on, like so many people were trying to buy him, buy his script, but, you know, like write him out of it or, you know, cast like a, a famous name in his part and how he like held on to it until the end and how that gamble paid off. Um, so to go back to one of your early questions, why did I give it up? Well, I mm-hmm. looked in the mirror and went, hmm, hmm, let's just look at the odds of this mm-hmm. going. Right. It wasn't yeah. going to happen. I mean, or the and- odds were not in my favor. And more than that, I didn't love acting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, everything I learned about acting and loved about it when I was doing it has informed my, my, uh, my, I'll say talent or, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way I proceed as a director. Um, but also the producing I did at my little theater company, Theater West, where I produced, you know, close to 40 original, you know, short plays, um, uh, and how Chaz knew of my work as a producer, you know, Mm -hmm. that went on to win lots and lots and lots and lots of awards. Mm -hmm. Um, and but I was also getting a reputation as a a producer who could you know do something in the theater, and it was also where I found material. Mm. Um, and I love that you said it was actually not hard for you to make the career pivot because in my mind it's like you moved from New York to LA presumably for acting, and within a short time you were like you discovered this love of the rehearsal process, and you were just like let's go in this. It seemed like you were you're a bold decision maker. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, and why not be? Mm-hmm. What do you lose? And, and listen, was it listen, a- unless you make a hugely, hugely bad mistake, you know, or get doxxed or, you know, something for where you, you just go, oh, no, that's a career stopper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, usually it's not. Um, uh, people don't remember the bad things. They just remember the successes. So, right. And, and, was and, it- and, and my, and my bottom line was always to be kind, supportive and respectful. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you get a reputation for that and people want to work with you. And was it a conscious decision for you to, you know, you, you had done like theater directing to be like, Hey, I want to do TV. Oh, um, I, did. Or- I definitely, definitely knew I wanted to do television and I Not didn't. Film. And, and you all, I applied to like the, um, there was a program called Chanticleer Films. It was doing, launching a lot of careers and winning consistent Oscars for shorts. Mm. And I thought about that. And I was taken aside um, by the woman who runs that program, who's still a lifelong friend, Jana Sue Memel. And Jana said, when I was 30, you need to, I think she might not have used these words, but it's, I'm going to use my mom's words, shit or get off the pot. <laughs> Which really meant... This is a young person's game. And if you're not going to dive into wanting to be a young feature director, um, you should get out now. And, mm-hmm. and that's when I chose to say, hey, I really want to do television. And to this day, I really, 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 mm-hmm. really want to do television. And what and, made you want to do television back then? Because it's de- it definitely wasn't the television of today, wouldn't you say? It's- no, no, but it was regular. It was a new script every 
episode. It was fast paced. It was, mm-hmm. it, it just suited what I like about it. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the parts about acting that, you know, when I look at people, for friends of mine who have been very successful, who mm-hmm. have reached a hundredth, two hundredth performance of a, of a show on Broadway, mm-hmm. I, I start, I start going crazy at 20, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so variety was important to me mm. and television provided that and, and that it took less time to get the job, do the job and go on to the next job. I mean, mm. features was all about development and, mm. you know, ha- hitching your wagon to something that was, could take two years, three years, four years and might not go any place. I mean, I have my first um, pilot at a major network, um, NBC, in development right now for uh, four books I optioned. Um, and I think we did the pitch. The first pitch, probably for almost a year. And that was wow. a long, long time for me to be attached wow. to something that was trying to move it along. And, you know, in TV, there's breaks you take because no one's looking at stuff, you know, during upfronts. Mm-hmm. No one's, you know, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. during the high pilot season, no one wants to look at something new. They're, they're trying to concentrate on what they did by this season. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, um, but uh, that, that's a big, important step for me to now mm-hmm. be um, initiating projects and putting teams together of things that I think will sell. Right. Wow. That's another, another, it's like another, you know, whatever, like multi hyphenate for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll, Cause uh, if this, if this goes, I'll be EPing and directing the pilot. Wow. Okay. Well, and we I will definitely. Writers. I picked the, the showrunner. I picked the line producer. I optioned the material from the, the novelist. Okay. Well, we will definitely talk about this in a little bit. I'm circling it. <laughs> so um, in your kind of like in your, I know you said you took the initiative, you called, you shadowed people, like you, you like you made introductions uh, or you were asked to, you know, be introduced to people in order to kind of get your first TV directing uh, gig. Were you, were you intimidated by the fact that there were very few female TV directors back then? No. Because, you know, listen, if you look at the, uh, m- that person who gave me my first job, one of them, mm-hmm. Ian Prazer, told me. You know, when I was sleeping on the sofa, there are no roadblocks, only detours. Mm, wow. So I and believe did you feel like I've always, uh, I've always operated on that. That's a great, that, that's a great line for our listeners to, to, you know, to take in. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm sure there were many detours. Yeah. And then the second thing I'll add that I knew or learned was, and you can't get pissed off while waiting. Ah, that's a great one. Yes, because so many people, they, you know, actors, whomever, like anyone in this industry, part of the waiting game or part of the, you know, as you're working through the detours, you get frustrated and then you get, and then you get, I don't know, like you you get grumpy. And what I tell so many of our actors is like, hey, you may have be having the worst day when you come here for a class, like it's a great opportunity, like, like leave it at the door. Like why bring in that negative energy? You know, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, that's great advice. So it sounds like you just steamrolled through all the detours. Like it was like, you must have had many detours. I did. I did. I mean, at when to try to get my first shot at episodic directing, when I d- decided that's really, really, really what I wanted to do and not sitcoms mm-hmm. anymore, it was three years. And wow. I saw people who were, you know, nobody was making that jump from sitcoms to our episodic, but I wanted to do it. And I just and thought, I'll figure out how. Did you want to, like, was it a, con- like, did you want to kind of specialize in sitcom directing or was it like, that's just no, the no, opportunity? No, no. Just, were- that's where my first job was. That's where I got the first experience. And I knew once I was on that, that wonderful roller coaster mm-hmm. that to establish a reputation there would be my first calling card to anything else I wanted to do. So I knew, I always knew I I would go home and I didn't watch sitcoms. I went home and watched Law and Order. Uh Uh-huh. (laughs) Uh-huh. I knew that's eventually where I'd want to be. 
but knew that until I was working steadily mm-hmm. and had an occasion of working steadily as a sitcom director mm-hmm. um, and going from show to show to show, which is when I quit mm-hmm. uh, and also when there was a lull in sitcoms and I went, hmm, 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 make the move now, make the move now. What because- year would you say that was? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I really can't. And at the same time, I was also developing, I had some movies of the week being developed uh-huh. or features based on plays I had directed and optioned. Uh-huh. Um, so I was, you know, I had, you know, fingers in a lot of pots there um, right. at that time, but I saw the writing on the wall. Mm-hmm. I also knew that people who were the most popular sitcom directors If the pot got smaller, if there were less sitcoms to direct, and there was a huge, huge dip, Mm -hmm. I would not still be at the top of the heap. Why is that? Why did you think that? Because I wasn't. Hmm. Because you're realist. I don't have to name them. Uh huh. But the guys were going to get shots before I did, Mm. and they did. And I went, "Ah, okay, time to. Go try that that other thing I want to do, and there and your timing couldn't be better. Right, right. And but I was, so that I was really good at reading the room and reading trends. Uh huh. And would you say it was harder for you to transition to episodic versus for you for you to get your first directing gig? Period. All those yes. years ago. Yes. Like. Because you you kind of would you say like yeah. they kind and of I had pigeonholed two you? Emmys by that point. I had two local Emmys. Wow. 125 episodes of sitcoms. And still, it was like, it was like barking at a tree that nobody wanted to let me in. And I got my in mainly because an actor who I had worked with said, I want Mary Lou to direct my series. Ah, and wow. His, his wife saying, you got to get let Mary Lou direct your series. And it was Tony Shalhoub and Brooke Adams. Oh, oh, and wow. Then, same kind of support from Scott Bakula, you know, and I had the same kind of support from, um, you know, people. Uh, I've had a career of actors requesting me, you know, D.L. Hughley for his sitcom. You know, mm-hmm. there were a lot of people who wanted to work with me because I was also simultaneously an acting coach. Mm-hmm. So and people- would you say there were more roadblocks for women directors in sitcoms or in episodic procedural? You know, there were a couple really, really well known. Um, the person who's being talked about a lot uh, because uh, Daniels, um, they don't want to be called the Daniels. Daniels um, studied with her at um, Sundance. Um, Joan Darling had established herself. Linda Day had re- had established herself. Lee Shalit Schemmel had. Um, Establish herself. There was a, a few more women who were really predominant sitcom directors. So um, I would say it was much harder in the episodic field. Mm, wow. Uh, also in the episodic field, there was way more opportunities. Right. And now that you've been, you know, uh, steadily. Look at the, the percentages. You know, yeah. Yeah. You're very good at that. <laughs> And now that you've been steadily working in the episodic field, like how has it just been like, it's kind of like once you break through it, the, the work just keeps coming or do you still yeah, find it's not that? Necessarily, you know, always, um, you know, if I had told you the five shows I would love to direct next season, if anything, I will tell you four of them won't even look at me. Really? Even with, yeah. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, yeah. you know, I am happy, happy, happy with what I have. Um, and I think that's part of my um, my my success stories. You know, th- there's a definition for s- happiness and success. And happiness is wanting what you get. And success is getting what you want. And oh. I always wanted to be happy. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> so, Very deep. Um, I'm very, very grateful for what comes my way. I'm a little fatalistic about things come for a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And 
as long as I can keep the variety in the kinds of things I'm directing, I will always have, I will always be happy. I'm in a singularly position that I'm very grateful for. I've already, you know, put, uh, my husband and I have put two kids through college. Mm-hmm. Um, I own the house I'm living in. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have enough income that I can contribute to causes that I believe in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, so I also don't have, have to take everything because I need to pay the bills. Right, you know? right, right. right. Um, and and, my, and, and you, I've always been with a partner, my husband, who, you know, has always worked as mm-hmm. well. So we've had, we've had that, that lovely, um, that lovely uh, benefit of at least one income all the time and mostly two incomes. And is he a director as well? I, I think He directs, he produces, he is a fabulous cinematographer, an award-winning cinematographer, wow. but he basically... Um, said goodbye to his agent about five, six years ago and became a full-time university professor. And he is so happy and wow. so good at what he does. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, he doesn't arrive, you know, for seeing me for a weekend and they've just written in a, a role and I go, oh my gosh, he's played a gynecologist or he's played a doctor so many times, you know, we're not even going to audition somebody because he's got to be camera ready this afternoon. And the casting director says, oh, thank God. They look at an IMDb page and they just give him the part. You know, wow. he has those kinds of parts where, or Tony Schlub will call from Paramount and said, when's the last time you did a monk? He said, three years ago. He goes, that'll be fine. He said, we're writing a part right now. Take a shower, bring a suit. We're s- n- 10 blocks from Paramount. Can you be here in an hour? And Charlie will go, yes. And then he does, you know, the second guest star he does on monk, you know, so. Amazing, so, amazing. So things like that. And both of your kids are actors. A wonderful, wonderful actor. But um, he's also a brilliant and well-loved um, and Professor. unbelievably supportive teacher. And I know his students yes, for him. And I think, you know, we're also, you know, at that age, we're giving back his... Right. And, and he's a professor of acting or of, of cinematography? Uh, he teaches and- acting, he pr- teaches acting um, in the MFA program at a a place he commutes from LA to San Francisco and he teaches wow. at um, Academy Academy of the Arts University. Wow. And then going. both and then of your kids home. are also actors. What? Both of your what? kids are also actors. Only my son is. My daughter, oh, my uh, they both went to the Performing Arts High School and both studied acting there. And senior year, I remember my daughter doing the lead in a play at the Performing Arts High School. It was a big deal. She was approached by a big manager and she looked her in the eye. I think the manager said, well, I'd like to um, represent you. Do you know what that means? She goes, yeah, my parents are in the business. I know exactly what that means. <laughs> she looked back in the eye and she said, when would I do my homework? Oh my God. <laughs> and that was my, you know, and at Sarah Lawrence, she was known as that little smart one. Oh. Um, it's two languages and she is a director of a very, very prestigious but small gallery in New York city. And, you know, I knew from the time she was a kid and had that um, job as an intern or apprentice or Mm part-time job at Los Angeles County museum of art, that she would be in the art world. I knew it from Mm -hmm. a touch. And your son's also in New York as an actor. He's an actor in New York and he's wonderful. And just did a fabulous, fabulous uh, part for me on true lies. um, playing And he's, you know, it's exactly the kind of part he should do. And, and, you and know, how was that experience for you? To- you know, against everybody else. Mm-hmm. And Matt Nix created the series. And, oh, I think he used the word, he's really appealing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, was, that, was that just like a great experience to have your son on set and get a chance to? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, and to know that I needed something in two takes and he would nail it. He right, did. Right. You yeah. know, it's, yeah, he's, he's a money player. Isn't that how you heard about us? Like, cause he was like a member at one-on-one X level yeah. or. He might, but also years, years back. Wasn't next level also on ninth Avenue up in the film center building. I taught a sitcom mm-hmm. class a couple times. Mm-hmm. In we used to one be in like a townhouse. In New York city as well, but I don't know how I got back to you in LA. It might've been through my son. Yeah. Yeah. But cause I think that, that's, that's how you. Fabulous. Hire him. 
<laughs> Nobody does special programs like one on one next level. It's where we really help actors shine. I'm Emilio. I signed with my Southeast agent right after the Atlanta trip, and now I'm auditioning several times every month. And you know, I almost didn't do the Atlanta trip because I thought it was just another cash grab. I can tell you from experience that it's not. That's not how one on one next level rolls. And here we are six months later, and I already booked my first job with my Atlanta agent. I'm Rebecca, and the Bridge program demystified the industry for me. It gave me the platform to get off book in under 10 minutes. I met 60 new artists that are now all a part of my community, and I even signed with a manager. I have never walked away from a program so confident in my abilities. I'm so grateful for One on One Next Level. My name is Capenna, and I can finally call myself a working actor after participating in the LA Super Showcase. I had just moved to LA and I felt stuck. I came across the LA Super Showcase and let me tell you, it was a life-changing experience. I signed with an agent and since then, I've been auditioning for series regulars and booked my first TV job. I finally feel like I made it to the next level, thanks to One on One Next Level. In the next 12 months, One on One Next Level will host 27 special programs bringing you unmatched, exclusive access to industry connections. Special programs aren't just a one and done class. Instead, they're designed to accomplish in a weekend what it takes most actors months, even years to do. So whether you want to get repped in a smaller market like Atlanta, bypass casting directors and connect directly with TV showrunners and decision makers, or spend a weekend meeting a bunch of musical theater industry professionals in New York City, you have to become a member to be eligible to sign up for our special programs. To apply, go to www.1on1nextlevel.com. We can't wait to hear your success story. Most of our you know, listeners are our members, so I definitely want to hit on some you know, like tips for them. Um, would love to kind of get your perspective on how actors can stand out in the audition process to you know, catch your eye at least. Well, my, the, there's a couple things that always like you get extra points with me. A, don't be needy. <laughs> Seriously, because <laughs> needy in an audition, you'll probably be needy on set. And TV is not the place where I have the time, especially for a guest star or a co-star to right. be going like this all the time. I have to do that with mm -hmm. the regular. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have a real take, make real decisions about the character, even if you think they might be wrong. Hopefully mm -hmm. you think they're right. Um, mm -hmm. But. I, it's so much easier for me to say, oh, they made that choice. I know exactly what that choice is, but what I want is this. It's very easy for me to direct you in another direction mm -hmm. and spoon and feed you any choice at all. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be you could read sides. I would say that's not the case anymore. You really need to know the material when you audition. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say 90% of the people who get 90% of the jobs are off book. Mm -hmm. and know it backwards and forwards. Um, so much so that if the casting director made a flub and you were listening, you would know, you would pick up on that and know how to, you know, mm -hmm. make that usable. You know, if someone, and doing that on set is always an mm -hmm. asset. Um, um, and be very, very f flexible in terms of being directed because sometimes, mm -hmm. Even if you think, no, this is the way I want to do this. And this is what, um, yeah, but I might not be looking at that. I might be looking mm -hmm. at how we work together. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so, so just know I'm, 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 I'm deciding a lot of things in the audition. Um, be on time. Can I mm -hmm. say that again? You'd be kind of shocked and appalled about how many people aren't on time. Uh-huh. <laughs> or early because right. on time is late. Right. Um, but I would say those, and listen, really, really, you know, 90% of the people I cast, I cast for not how they say the words, it's how they react to what's being said to them. Mm, that's another so great. If they're listening in character, it's a great measure of about how deep this character has gone. Also, for an example, person, when my son... At the performing arts high school, played Pippin, the guy who played the leading player, the Ben Vereen role. Um, I just cast in a recurring role on Kingdom Business. Wow. Uh, mind you, he's already had his first, you know, multiple years on a series. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, Wu Tang. Um, he's already done a Broadway show and already done a big national tour. So it's, you know, he's got a, a lot of credibility. But he was coming on to do a tiny scene which introduces him as opposed to the next three episodes, which are going to be big Mm -hmm. um, and figure into this plot in a big way. Um, So, uh, but he did come in and it's the end of the day. It's the last scene. I'm, I'm against the wall, but he came in and said, okay. And the two showrunners were there. And I said, come over here. He said, I have four questions. I said, go. One, one, one. And we answered every single one of them before he had to do his first scene. But he had done a fabulous audition. We'd asked him to do the part with an accent and without an accent. Mm -hmm. He had done both seamlessly and on the spot. I didn't tell him ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first question was, am I doing this? And I said, well, actually, we haven't decided yet. So we're going to do it both ways. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Um, and then, you know, and then, uh, but in terms of having the background for his character, he knew that to do his best work that night, even for the two lines he had, Mm -hmm. he had to know the background. So, you know, it it was, he came in so well prepared Mm -hmm. and, you know, it was, you know, and, and people were fussing with his costume ahead of time and, you know, and he just stayed focused on who he was how we fit into the scene, what his purpose was in the story. And he just was fabulous. I was so And I feel like you've kind of already answered this next question with with that last answer. But this is something I asked um, a few months ago. We had Norman Buckley, another TV director on, you know, on the podcast. Norman is my producing director on on, um, Sweet Magnolias. I adore him. I feel like our entire conversation today has just been, we're like, a, well, it's like, it's like a family of, of webs together. <laughs> but also um, one of the most knowledgeable people about film that I've ever met. I mm, mean, he's up in the top five. Right. Wow. Um, so I asked him, I was like, you know, because both, both, you know, Norman, uh, you know, and you talked about, you know, actors that you've met on set that you just really, you just really like them and you want to reuse them and you want to like cast them in, over and over again. So I know a lot of our listeners are like, okay, you know, I, I, I booked the job. Thank God. What can I do on set, if anything, to kind of be on that like list of actors that the producers, the writers, the directors just love and want to use on their next project? Right. Not needy, no maintenance, <laughs> creative choices, on time, work and play well with others. And when you're asked to come to the set, stop in the middle of your text, put your phone down, leave your phone in the room. And come and do your work. <laughs> I love that. I love that you said when you're asked to come on set, like put your phone down. <laughs> well, you can't imagine how many people, you know, when I when I say, are they in the van yet? Are they moving? Have they left their trailer? How many times the answer is no. Or they come to set and instead of coming to the set where we're working, they go to craft service first. Don't be <laughs> Don't be the foodie in me, I was like, uh oh, that, that that might be me. I have a long list of life is too short, mm-hmm. and it starts mm-hmm. with that person who didn't come to set. They wanted to go to craft service first. Right, right. <laughs> I love that. I've ne- I've never heard that before, and I, that that is probably my favorite my favorite thing ever. <laughs> Um, so that's, so I I asked this last question kind of to all of our guests, you know, as I told you at the beginning, this is our 30th anniversary podcast because the studio has been been around for over 30 years. Thank you. And it hasn't always been easy for us. And we kind of have a motto here that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, um, and kind of the, the, the slogan of our podcast is how they made it happen. So I'd love to ask you uh, if you can share a story or two that stand out in your journey of a time when you feel like you had to take a risk against all the odds and everyone was like, don't do that, Mary Lou. That's a dumb idea. It'll never happen. And you took a chance and against all the odds, you persevered. Like everything? <laughs> but uh, I, that, uh, <laughs> I almost sounds like that sounds like your entire career. <laughs> it is. Um I, I seriously, I just approach life that way. 
You know, yeah. I had a sixth grade teacher who said, you know, this is the problem solving process. I think she was doing it to teach us writing and how to come up with ideas for stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, identify the problem, brainstorm solutions, evaluate solutions, make a decision, act on one, evaluate whether it worked or not. Mm. I approach my entire life that way. And what gives you this perseverance? Because most people don't have it. And you're very... You, I'm sorry? I love what I do. It's not work. Mm. It's not hard. I, my, my husband and I, again, we don't have to work. Lots of people, you know, people we went to high school with are retiring. And we look at each other and we go, mm, 20 more years at least. I mean, right. literally, I would love to be doing this 20 years from now. But I also you know, love that. Like, like, you know, that our health is still good and we're able to and mm -hmm. we'll still find my input or his input valuable. But mm -hmm. we love, love, love doing what we do. So, But there's this drive about you that's like, it's just positive, but it's also like, it's almost like the detours don't, don't piss you off. They don't. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't because I I know they're part of the journey. Right. I love. What were you? How what were your? What did your parents do? I'm so curious. Like like. It My father was uh, had his uh, bachelor's of business administration. Okay. Who was really a a big um, example to me because he wanted to get his college degree for my eldest brother. I have three older brothers and the younger sister. Um, he finished his bachelor's degree by going to night school the whole time I was growing up, the year before my brother graduated from Georgetown. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that was a great example. My mom um, uh, went back to work when I was 12 years old. Um, she was an executive secretary at a big corporation. You know, she, she was a person who was accepted at Juilliard. My mother was, and I say this with a huge knowledge of what I'm saying, my mother was a world-class lyric soprano, accepted at Juilliard, and didn't go because her father didn't believe women should go to college. Mm. And he mm. made her go to secretarial school. Mm. And that's what my mother uh, eventually did uh, before she had kids. And then once I was 12, she went back and did it until she retired. And she was really wow. good at it. And she typed all the papers. <laughs> That's amazing. I, I th thank you for you know sharing your journey, sharing your background, and uh, last but not least, I know there's so many initiatives that uh, you know and causes that you care about, and I wanted to see if you wanted to share any of those with our with our listeners. You know, I'm now a governor at the Television Academy in the director okay. peer group. Mm -hmm. um, I am shocked at how many people don't know they are eligible to be a member of the Television Academy. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, and it's my one for this, this, especially actors, you mm -hmm. know, so many actors, they go, well, I have to be invited. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. You just right. have to meet the eligibility, pay the initiation fee. April 17th is a deadline to vote in this year's Emmys, but you have to be paid up and accepted by that point. So start now, but find out how close you are or if you're eligible already Mm -hmm. to become a member of the Television Academy and take part in their educational programs, their For Your Consideration programs. It's a great, great, I'm going to say this again, great place to network mm -hmm. and meet people and learn inside information. I cannot tell you how many strategic emails I have written to people who then hired me because of things I learned by watching, by being president at a For Your Consideration event or an event of the Directors Guild um, mm. or other places where I just listen and go, oh, I want to follow up on that. Just like during a meeting, someone mentions a book that they've read right. and I go home or go to the library on the way home, get that book, read it and write them a note two weeks later saying, oh, I love that you suggested this because it reflects on my tenacity and my follow through. And the fact is, it's usually a good book. Right, right. You know, I or, or you know, they mentioned this show that they're watching. I go, oh, I haven't watched that. I'll watch that and go, oh, I wouldn't have watched it if you hadn't said it, this event. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just in the audience, you know. Yeah. Although I try not to be the word just too often. <laughs> this great networking. To, I, I second that. I'm a member of the uh, Television Academy. And, you know, those events also have great food, I have to add. <laughs> yes, they do. And some of them are on Zoom and, and for, for people 
who are especially uh, not in the same city. You know, there's lots of events that you can go to, but isn't it great those for your consideration things? Yeah, yeah. There, so it's it's there's such camaraderie there, which is sometimes yeah. hard to find in LA. I have to say, and what's nice is that those events are attended by people who are crew members. You know, mm-hmm. in every single category, they have mixers at the academy that you know where you'll go. Oh, I'm I'm gonna we're gonna be with the makeup artists. You mm-hmm. know, and you know one of my one of my dearest and most successful director friends was head of a hair department for probably 20 years before she made the leap into directing. And she's a producing director on um, a Shonda Rhimes show now and wow. was the hardest working director before she started doing that job and not just directing, you know, eight episodes a season, which was huge. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't done it yet, grab the backstage pass. You've got to get the backstage pass. There's behind the scenes footage. We've taken the biggest takeaways from the episode and written them down for you. There's also tools and resources to help move your career forward. It's the easiest way to turn this podcast into a tool for your career, as opposed to something you just listen to as you're doing the dishes.